The reason it's so important for all of you to understand the principles and practice of effective seismic retrofitting is that without this knowledge, there's no way for you to understand what you're paying for. Just as if you were buying a, a car, you want to make sure you knew everything you could about it before paying for it. In the same way, on a retrofit, you need to understand what you're getting for your money. For this reason, I'm going to explain to you how it works, and that way you can take this information armed to evaluate bids, to ask contractors questions, and ask billing inspectors questions. Oftentimes, the billing inspector will come over and he will literally have no idea what he's looking for, and you may have to help him. This shows where the cripple wall is located on a house. Notice where the top of the stairs are. This is where the floor is located. So between the foundation and this floor, there's a short wall called a cripple wall. This is the area where all retrofitting takes place. Here's a typical house with a cripple wall. One of the ways you can tell if your house has a cripple wall is by the number of steps that lead up to the floor. Now if you look directly below the window, there's a vent. At the bottom of that vent is the foundation. Between the foundation and the floor, which is located slightly above the top of that vent, that's where the cripple wall is. So here's an illustration of what happens when a cripple wall collapses. As you can see, when the earthquake rocks the house back and forth, the cripple walls are not able to support the house and keep it from collapsing. Here is a house where you can see the cripple wall about to collapse. At the bottom in the gray, you see the foundation. Then you see the 2x4s of the cripple wall. And at the top of the 2x4s is the floor of the house, which is slid to the right approximately a foot. This is a house that was damaged in the 1989 Loma Prieta earthquake. This damage occurred in Watsonville, California, where I was an inspector for the Federal Emergency Management Agency. If you look at the floor of the house, it is now very, very close to the ground. If you look at where the steps used to go into the house, they're much, much higher than where the floor is right now. This is due to a cripple wall collapse. Here's another house that suffered a cripple wall collapse. This occurred in the 1992 Ferndale earthquake in California. I was the FEMA inspector for this home, and when I looked at it from the outside, it looked intact. The windows were in good condition, the door looked like it was in good condition, but I did notice, as you will notice, that the top of the stairs is much, much higher than the floor. This is because of the cripple wall collapse. Once I went inside, I saw so much damage that the house needed to be torn down. This is the same house as seen from the inside. In addition to the damage to the plaster, this house also suffered serious damage to the electrical system and the plumbing system. This house was no longer habitable. The people who lived in this house had to live in a shelter provided by the Federal Emergency Management Agency. Here I am showing you the illustration of the cripple wall as seen from underneath the house. I'm doing this because I'd like to emphasize the importance of knowing what the components are and how they function in a retrofit. Each one of these components can fail in some way in an earthquake and require addressing in a retrofit. Here's an illustration of what happens when a cripple wall is attacked by an earthquake. As you can see by the center illustration, when the earthquake force hits, as shown by the red arrow, the cripple wall can collapse. Imagine the floor on top of the cripple wall, which can weigh upwards of 50,000 pounds. Imagine it rocking back and forth on top of the cripple wall, and the cripple wall is simply unable to maintain the floor in an upright position. The way this is repaired is by installing plywood on the cripple wall.
These images illustrate why it is necessary to bolt a house to the foundation. The image on the far left shows a house where the cripple wall has been braced with plywood to keep it from collapsing. However, if we don't attach this to the foundation with bolts, the plywood, the cripple wall, and the house itself can still slide on the foundation and cause structural damage. We do this by installing bolts through what's called the mud sill shown in pink on the upper left. We put bolts through that into the foundation so that the bottom of our cripple wall cannot slide on top of the foundation. Here we see how bolts prevent the bottom of the cripple wall from sliding. As you can see in the center illustration, as the earthquake force, represented by the red arrow, pushes on the bottom of the cripple wall, also known as a mud sill, it will slide. Now if bolts are installed through the mud sill and into the concrete, this movement is prevented. Notice how these bolts have something called mud sill plates. Mud sill plates were developed after the 1994 Northridge earthquake. They were developed because of observed damage to bolts where the mud sill split. The teeth on the mud sill hold the mud sill together to keep it from splitting. In addition, a mud sill plate provides a 59% increase in overall bolt strength. Here you can see the kind of damage that can still occur when the house is bolted to the foundation and the cripple wall is braced with plywood. As you can see by this illustration, as the earthquake rocks the house back and forth, the cripple wall remains upright, remains on the foundation, but the house can still fall off the cripple wall. This movement is prevented by something called shear transfer ties. As you can see, the floor you walk on is sitting on top of something called a floor joist. When the earthquake force pushes against the floor joist, the floor joist can move. This movement is prevented by attaching the floor joist to the top of the cripple wall with shear transfer ties. Here is a photograph of two commonly used shear transfer ties. The green arrow is superimposed on top of the end joist. If the end joist were to move, it could cause serious structural damage to the house. So here's a summary of everything we've discussed so far. As you can see by the illustration at the top, movement at the bottom of the cripple wall on top of the foundation is prevented by the bolts. The cripple wall itself is prevented from collapse by the installation of plywood. And the movement of the floor on top of the cripple wall is prevented by shear transfer ties. All three components are part of an effective retrofit. Your contractor should be able to show you how it is that the movement of your floor will be restrained by the shear wall. The red arrow on the upper left represents the earthquake force pushing against the end floor joist. When the end floor joist moves, it pushes against the shear transfer tie shown by the yellow arrow. When the shear transfer tie tries to move, it pushes against the top plate, shown by the orange arrow. When the top plate tries to move, it pushes against the cripple wall, shown by the blue arrow. When the cripple wall is covered with plywood, it pushes against the plywood, and the plywood Nails push against the mud sill, shown by the white arrow. When the mud sill moves, it pushes against the foundation bolt, 
When the foundation bolt tries to move, it pushes against the concrete. When the concrete in the foundation moves, it pushes against the ground. In the end, the movement of the floor is dissipated into the ground, which is what you want to have happen. Make sure that your retrofit contractor can show you exactly how this is going to happen, and it should make sense to you. After watching this video, I hope you understand that all retrofits require three components. That's the shear transfer ties, the bolts, and the plywood. Now, make sure that whenever you get a bid from a contractor that all these components are there. And also make sure that there's enough of them and not too much. That way you'll save money and you'll get an effective retrofit.